He was educated at NYU, he has a BA in philosophy, and he went on to um, do a master's of philosophy in European culture and literature at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. He's been awarded all sorts of uh, awards, uh, including a fellowship from the U.S. Ful uh, Fulbright Foundation in journalism, which he did at the Free University of Berlin. Um, he is a regular uh, correspondent in Germany and based in Berlin for the Jerusalem Post. And he also writes frequently for other um, journals and newspapers uh, internationally. Uh, and he speaks internationally. And is um, a well-known uh, expert on the ground on, on the issue that he's going to speak to us today. And I'll just say that on a personal note, that um, for some of you who know, I think um, perhaps one of the reasons why the Institute was created here was because of the upsurge of anti-Semitism globally around the world. Um, dealing, you know, the issue I think of radical Islam, Islamists that we were discussing yesterday with Hassan Tibi, and the sort of um, the silence in the West um, among the intellectual community, among scholars, um, and some might say some on the left, and some sectors on the left in the West, uh, there's sort of an acquiescence to this genocidal anti-Semitism. And it's, you know, as we know philosophically, every action, every inaction has repercussions, and the silence is having, having a, a profound effect in terms of anti-Semitism and I think basic human rights. And Benny um, has been a voice, I think, of, uh, of uh, civility and democracy in, uh, in a place where people for uh, a few shekels are uh, trading in their, their values. I think Benny has been holding a spotlight. I think Henri Bernard Levy says that the role of an intellectual is to shine light where there's darkness, and Benny has been really doing that, and I'm not trying to flatter him, he's really been doing that in, uh, in Berlin, and I think putting the light and exposing hypocrisy in a dangerous form of hypocrisy, um, as you'll hear, I'm sure, this afternoon, how uh, German economic relations and support of uh, a regime which is done away with notions of citizenship and which violates human rights and uh, women's rights and gay rights and minority rights and is uh, threatening to uh, commit another genocide. Mm -hmm. So Benny is there on the front lines and he's paying a price, I think, for his outspokenness. So it's really an honor to have you here and uh, eagerly awaiting you. So thanks for coming. Thanks, Carl. Of course, I'd, I'd hate him to say that, but I'm very small feet. Um, the, well, first, um, it's great that folks could carve out time to, to attend this talk. It, it, you know, it might sound a bit obscure, um, but um, it's, um, it's one of the more pressing um, challenges right now on the continent, uh, Germany-Iranian Germany relations and, and how that's playing out in terms of the Iranian threat. I've been reporting in Germany since 2002, um, living there since late 2001, um, and my beat is, is Austria, Germany, and um, Switzerland. Let me just, I'm, I'm going to cover four points, I think we have about uh, four or five hours, I was told, so um, no, I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to limit this, this enormously complex topic to 20, 30 minutes, and then we can open up the questions, and I, and I, I would encourage a lot of crossfire, because good questions are better than good answers. Um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to provide those good answers, but hopefully there will be a lot of good questions. Four points, that I'm, or at least four topics that I'm going to cover just so you have a heads up. One is the, the German-Iranian um, economic relationship and the Iranian nuclear program, the, the threat to the Middle East, Europe, and the United States. The second point will be Europe's reaction to Operation Cast Lead in January, late December, January. And um, Iran, Iran, Iranian anti-Semitism, Iran's um, um, fanatical um, anti-Semitism. My third point will deal mainly with with um, German anti-Semitism, Islamic anti-Semitism in Germany, and this toxic mix of the two, and how that that toxic cocktail is currently playing out in terms of the Iranian threat. And my last point, hopefully we'll have enough time, is um, how to combat anti-Semitism on the continent, or in Germany in particular, Europe in general, what type of pro-Israel advocacy work is being done there that can help to, to combat some of the um, intense hatred of Israel. Um, my departure point is, and I'm, 
is that contemporary anti-Semitism in Europe right now is largely fixated on Israel. Um, there's all different forms of anti-Semitism, but um, that is my departure point for this, for this talk right now. About a year ago, from, on March 17, Chancellor Angela Merkel held, delivered a speech in the Knesset. Many of you might have read about it. Um, and it was the first time that a German chancellor spoke in the Knesset. She spoke in German. It caused some controversy. Some members of the Knesset walked out. But she delivered her speech. It was widely praised. She um, declared Israel's security to be non-negotiable. She declared Israel's security interest to be an essential component <coughs> of Germany's national security interest. And she declared that Israel or Germany will isolate Iran politically and economically and um, work to stop its nuclear weapons program. So those were lofty words, widely praised. In Germany, she did take some heat because um, her critics said she didn't criticize the Israelis um, and didn't um, mention the, the Palestinian situation. Um, at the same time she delivered this speech, um, her undersecretary in the economics ministry, Hartmut Shorte, from the same party, the Christian, Christian Democratic Union Party, was um, peddling his influence to secure a deal that would allow a firm in his election district in Nordheim-Westfalen, the firm is called Steiner, um, to build three plants in Iran to convert natural gas into liquid gas. It was a hundred million euro deal, and this was taking place at the same time America was holding her speech. Um, several months later, he boasted in a regional newspaper about this deal, that he used his influence, that he was a nuisance, he was pesky, and that's why this regulatory agency in Germany issued a permit to this firm. It was in the middle of the summer, there wasn't a lot of news, I picked up on the story, I filed my dispatch with the Jerusalem Post, said this, you know, this is a scandal, but the Germans in general, the, 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 the sort of economic class and the political class ignore these types of deals, they don't want to publicize them, so the German media largely has just, this topic is nowhere on the radar screen. Suddenly, AP picked up the piece that I filed, and it was picked up it was, it was picked up at the same time, and then it started to gain traction. USA Today picked it up, the International Herald Tribune, and then um, some of the other Israeli newspapers a few days later picked it up, and it started to gain traction. Now, my theory is this story resonated um, at this stage because it was a, a low point in news reporting, but also it involved some factors that um, folks in this room can understand right away. Gas, Israel, Jews, and the Holocaust. And that caused, in the international press, it, um, a scandal, and it caused an unprecedented crisis between the Israeli government and the German government. This took place at a time when Germany was celebrating 60 years of Israel's existence. There were all, all sorts of events blanketing Germany, proclaiming, you know, in a revolutionary way, Israel's solidarity and how important Israel's security is. But at the same time, the German government and its representatives uh, were working overtime to seal a deal that was, in, from the perspective of critics, advancing the Iranian nuclear weapons program. This was a sector, the, the energy sector, the liquid gas sector. In, at that time, um, Gordon Brown, the British Prime Minister, and then President George Bush wanted to turn the economic screws on. They wanted to try to prevent deals in this type, in this, in this sector. But the Germans were undercutting, at that point, international efforts to isolate Iran. Merkel was, I, was, I believe, in Algeria vacation. I never understood what she was doing in Algeria at that point, but she was in Algeria when I, because I got a call after I filed my first dispatch. I was writing a series of reports because the scandal had reached that level. Um, the government was non-responsive to my press queries. I'd sent press queries to her party, to the government, to the foreign ministry, and they were all turning inward and avoiding the topic. Once it reached a level on the media radar screen, her spokesman called me up. I was home that evening and told me he just spoke to the chancellor. She wants to let she wants to let you know that this deal is not in her interest or in the government's interest. So, okay, Let's, you know I'll take the quote. Filed my a new dispatch, and uh, a German paper had also commissioned me to write a report, um, developed a large daily there, um, and I also wrote a report for a German daily. Um, 
the, she was then forced, her government, to hold a press conference in which she again reiterated this line or her spokesman and said that German firms should have a moral sensitivity when dealing with the Islamic Republic of Iran. They didn't enact any legislation, but they talked about a moral sensitivity. Um, so that's what took place. It, 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 it created an enormous amount of tension between the Israelis and the Germans. It was the first time, I believe, in, in decades that it had reached a crisis level. Abramovich and the, and the foreign ministry, the, the director general, um, blasted Germany and Israel radio. It's unprecedented because most of these disputes between Germany and Israel um, take place um, in, you know, off stage when they rebuke each other. Um, but this turned into a public spat. <coughs> So that was the, the sort of crisis in terms of German-Israeli relations in 2008. There were other, <coughs> other conflicts, but that, that took place, as you can see, on an international level. Um, the end of 2008, um, after Merkel issued this statement about um, having, you know, uh, using sort of a moral standard when, when negotiating deals with Iran, I looked at the numbers, the trade numbers. The trade increased 10.5%. Obviously, the German firms weren't, weren't buying into her moral argument um, in 2008. Roughly, almost 5,000 deals took place in that year between Iran and Germany, 39 of which were dual-use good deals. That means dual-use um, contracts involve um, contracts that can be used for military or civilian purposes. The German government, there's a regulatory agency, won't disclose the nature of the deals or what, what, you know, what type of military or civilian purposes um, those deals could be used for. So there's no transparency. There's nothing even comparable to a FOIL law here, which folks have, which the United States has, the Freedom of Information law. Um, there's a watered-down law they just enacted, but as, as, as a journalist, um, it's, it's just an uphill battle to secure information in Germany. Now, the reason the, they're not hmm, disclosing the names of these firms, I found out during the course of my reporting over the last few years, reporting also on illegal trade between Germany and Iran, um, is a public prosecutor told me that if these firms are named, um, they won't have access to American markets. So they immediately um, reach agreements when they're being prosecuted for, for example, illegal trade with the local prosecutor's office to prevent um, disclosure of their firm's name. I wrote about this in Charetz, a long piece in the weekend edition about illegal trade, and um, a one German firm in, um, supplied Boucher, the nuclear power plant in, in Iran, which is going to be operational this year, um, with, with critical technology. Um, the firm was prosecuted. Um, the penalties were so absurd. You know, there were, there was a, the, the, these folks weren't incarcerated. Um, there's no in, real disincentive not to engage in illegal trade with Iran. Um, the trade laws um, are, are, again, laxly enforced. Um, so what I uncovered, um, I, I believe, is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of illegal trade. Um, now, then there's a the question of legal trade, which um, is, is very disturbing because, according to the former head of the German Iranian Chamber of Commerce, he issued an interview in and Focus, Mikhail Tochis, I think that's how you pronounce his name, um, several years ago said two-thirds of the German, uh, Iranian economy is dependent on Iranian, uh, German engineering parts. The Iranians are infatuated with German technology. I've talked to analysts in this field, and when you hear the argument in Germany, well, if, if, if we stop supplying the Iranians with all this sophisticated German engineering technology, they'll simply turn to the Russians and the Chinese. That's not the case. The Russian and Chinese technology is so inferior that it can't be replaced by German technology. But that's the, the policy line in Germany on all levels. Um, and um, it's, an, it's, it's, it's an argument that's limping on both legs. Um, so German trade continues. Last year, 4 billion euros. I mean, think about that, 4 billion in one year. It's been hovering each year around 4 billion. The German government, the federal government, Provides credit subsidies to the Iran to firms that are operating in 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 uh, Iran. Last year, I believe I wrote about this in the Wall Street Journal. I think the number was 250 million euros. Um, they dropped the German government has dropped the credit subsidies, reduced them, but still um, they're in place. 
And that sends a message to the Islamic Republic of Iran that we're going to subsidize German firms to engage in business deals with a regime that denies the Holocaust. Um, it's a bizarre world, but that's what's taking place. At the same time, I think this shows you why this special relationship between Germany and Israel, you've probably heard that phrase, you know, there's a special relationship. The question is, how special is the special relationship? Or is it not very special? And when you read Merkel's speech, Chancellor Merkel's speech in the Knesset, you have to start matching um, to see whether that rhetoric is actually filled with content and meaning, or whether there's really a gap that means whether her rhetoric is on one side of the fence, not just Merkel, but the foreign minister, the Social Democratic Party foreign minister, Frank Walter Steinmeier, whether their rhetoric is on one side of the fence and their actions are on the other side of the fence. And I'm interested in that disconnect, because there's no shortage of um, pro-Israel statements in Germany and believing in Israel's rights, right to exist, but at the same time, the government um, is the largest trading partner within the European Union with um, Iran, and is going to great lengths to provide the Iranians with um, technology that's helping support their infrastructure and technology that's helping them, in my view, build a nuclear weapons program. Um, the, to give you a sense of why this relationship is riddled with contradictions, in my view, um, a few years ago in, I believe, Sachsen or Sachsen Anhalt, maybe Clemens or Susanna knows, there was a, a Holiday Inn. And the, the manager of this Holiday Inn um, learned or, or heard about that, that two, several members of the National Democratic Party, the neo-Nazi party in Germany, which sits in two parliaments, um, reserved rooms in the Holiday Inn. He's German, and he said he, he canceled the reservations and said he was going to donate the money to a synagogue, and he was widely celebrated as a hero. And it was, it, it, it was reported extensively in the German press, and that's, that's what's taking place sort of domestically. But then when, when I raise questions internationally or with colleagues of, of mine, why, why are the deals, why are the deals <coughs> mushrooming in terms of Iran? Aren't the Iranians comparable to the National Democratic Party in Germany? In fact, aren't the Iranians worse? Because the neo-Nazi party is actually not denying the Holocaust. And when they do, they're prosecuted. But the Iranians are openly <coughs> denying the Holocaust. Um, and this, these sort of dialectical connections that one thinks should be made are not being made. And it's um, for many of us who are reporting on this, um, Israeli journalists or um, some journalists in journal Germany, it's unfathomable. Um, Germ the journalism in Germany is, um, and there are exceptions, but um, is alarming because um, these types of topics, as I mentioned, they're not, there's not even, there's occasionally a beep, a bleep on the, the cardiac monitor, but in general the line is flat. Um, this scandal in 2008 caused problems and they had to, they were forced to report on it, but again, they were forced, the German media was forced or, or compelled to report on it because the international press was reporting on it. So it rebounded back into Germany. And that's what takes place with, with a lot of these scandals. In terms of, in, in a, what, I'm trying to, to sort of highlight these connections, these sort of dialectical connections between German and Iranian trade and Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism. One, a couple of examples, again in 2008, it was a, a really a banner year for, for scandals in Germany, but um, Mohammed Larjani, actually this was in 2009, I'll, I'll just point to the recent scandal, that's the head of the, the, the so-called Iranian um, parliament, right, putting that in scary quotes because of, we're not dealing with a real functioning parliament, was at the Munich Security Council, where Joe Biden spoke in late February. Um, Mohammed Larjani, um, sorry, Ali, Mohammed's his brother, sorry, I'll get that. Ali Larjani, who was the former chief negotiator for the nuclear weapons pro, uh, program in Iran, he was dismissed, but he's the head of the parliament, um, denied the Holocaust. <clears throat> Two papers reported on it, and I was surprised, Spiegel and the Jerusalem Post. Um, he said in Iran, we have other sensitivities when, or perspectives when dealing with the Holocaust. It was a clear denial, and it got virtually no reporting. I was sitting in Berlin, <clears throat> observing this and, and watching the reports come in, and at the same time that this was unfolding in Munich, Larjani's Holocaust denial, the German press was pa just pathologically obsessed with this British bishop, Williamson, I believe his name is, who denied the Holocaust, who was in, at that time in a monastery in, in, in Argentina, right? He hadn't yet, I think, 
fled or been, he wasn't extradited. But his statements were blanketing the German papers, and they were talking about prosecuting him, and it was weeks and weeks of coverage. And I thought to myself, if, if there's a way to advance German relations between Jews and, and Germans, or in Israel and Germans, it would be, well, to, to stop trading with Iran instead of, you know, um, being totally consumed with this, this obscure British bishop, which really doesn't have any impact. And in my view, it, it has some impact, but in terms of, in terms of Israel's security, um, um, folks like Larajani and sending messages to them, but, you know, his brother as well, who spoke in 2008 at a, at a conference in, in Berlin. He was invited, his name's uh, uh, Mohammed Larajani, this is the brother from Ali, who is deputy foreign minister in one of the Mullah government regimes. Um, I think the last, I think Khatami, he was the deputy foreign minister, he's now the head of some institute. The foreign ministry in Germany invited him to attend a conference. Um, again, this got virtually no traction in Germany in terms of media coverage. At a conference sponsored by the foreign minister, the social democratic uh, foreign minister, he denied the Holocaust at an event, and he demanded that the Zionist state be canceled. Um, I called up the foreign ministry. I wrote about this for one German paper in the Jerusalem Post. I asked them, are you going to prosecute him? Holocaust denial is illegal. Um, and they, they told me, we, we rebuked him at some point on the telephone. My press queries about his brother who denied the Holocaust in February have, are still remain unanswered. Whether they rebuked him, whether they're going to prosecute him, um, they've been non-responsive. They did tell me that they did um, tell the Iranians at some point in the past that you know, denying the Holocaust is not really okay. It's, it's a bad thing. Sort of like when Schroeder uh, went to, um, Gerhard Schroeder, the former chancellor, went to Iran um, in March, um, was it March? No, sorry, February. He was, in, he was in Tehran, and he sort of issued the obligatory statement, Holocaust denial is a bad thing, and then he met with the Chamber of Commerce in Tehran, and he was there acting as a lobbyist for Gazprom, the Russian company. Um, that's what's happening behind this, you know, that, that, that's what's happening on the ground right now in, um, in Germany. Um, let me just speed ahead here because I know we're, we're pressed for time. Um, Germany's reaction to Operation Cast Lead. Is it, the relationship is, as I said, riddled with, with, with contradictions, the, the, the special relationship between Germany and Israel. And <coughs> there are examples. The Germans, um, and I'm, I'm critical of course, but at the same time, um, they, the German government, the former government, the red-green government, provided Israel with two dolphin submarines, which you might have read about, with second strike capability, second strike nuclear capability. Um, that was important for the German-Israeli relationship. Um, and Merkel, um, currently, and, and this is on the level of rhetoric, um, the Israelis have been pleased um, with her statements during the IDF operation in Gaza. She was the only head, only head of state in Europe to publicly um, blast Hamas as being the cause for this war. And, um, and her, the foreign minister, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, issued sort of a watered-down statement where you know, he was criticizing Hamas, but then um, as the head of the party, so he had some of his um, um, members of parliament then criticized Israel for a disproportionate response. Um, for example, the SP, SPD member of parliament, Rolf Butzenich, accused Merkel of siding with the permanent Israeli bombing of Gaza. It's interesting, too, because this gentleman, Rolf Butzenich, is also um, a member of the German-Israeli um, caucus. A, it's hard to believe. There's 111 members who are um, part of this German-Israeli caucus within the Bundestag. It's the second largest in um, the parliament. It's largely useless. He's also the chairman or the head person of the German-Iranian caucus. Um, he's, he's refused to answer all of my press queries in terms of his statements on Israel. Um, and he's also closely aligned with Frank Walter Steinmeier and uh, politically and um, Gerhard Schroeder. Um, he's considered um, very Iran-friendly. Um, and these are the types of contradictions. On the one hand, um, critics will argue he has the kosher um, um, stamp from the German-Israeli caucus, but then he's working, uh, he's, he's, he's not being very critical of Iran. 
In fact, he's um, at times functioning as sort of a junior personnel department, one could argue, for the Iranian regime. Um, so that's what took place during Operation Kastled. The On the ground, uh, and many of you may have read, seen what was taking place in the United Kingdom and, or in France, but in Germany there were mass demos taking place across the country. I attended three in Berlin, one of which there were 10,000 folks present. Um, the second one, I think, 8,000. The first one, I attended four or 5,000. I mean, they were just mushrooming across Germany. Um, and, you know, this was a, these were mini movements. These weren't, you know, what we what, what I read about in the states, where you have 40 people standing on a corner somewhere in Fort Lauderdale, so 10,000 people marching through cities, screaming, "Kill, kill Israelis! Kill, kill Jews! Gas the Jews!" Police didn't intervene. They intervened only when. Um, where there might have been signs equating the Star David with a swastika. Um, of course, what they were chanting was different from what was on a lot of the, the uh, signs, but those chants, at least as I understand it, are, are a violation of German law because the laws are stricter in terms of inciting um, hatred against um, Jews and, and some other minority groups. But the police largely did not intervene. There was, there was just a, a and across the board, I would, I would argue, lack of sensitivity in terms of um, understanding what really what anti-Semitism is, modern anti-Semitism in, in Germany. Um, one of my colleagues writing for a paper in Cologne, um, um, a daily, there, a large daily, a non-Jewish German journalist wrote that it's prob what we're experiencing in Germany right now, this was in January, is probably the largest outbreak of anti-Semitism since the period between 1933 and 45. Um, that gives you a sense of, of, of the dimension of what, what unfolded. Um, so there are, the response was from, government, from most government officials and civil society was um, indifference. And um, you know, it, was a, it was a frightening period, and this type of indifference to um, <coughs> intense hatred of Jews, Israelis, and the state of Israel um, was, was perplexing. Um, very disturbing. In order to, I think, to understand what's unfolding there, and many of you I know are, are, are immersed in this field, um, there are some concepts, and I can only deal with this in a, in a very sort of kitchen sink psychological way, and I'm going to grossly oversimplify enormously complex topics, but th that's, that's how we have to, we we're limited with time. Many of you have probably heard the sentence from the Israeli psychoanalyst Rex, uh, the Germans will never forgive the Jews for Auschwitz. Once again, the Germans will never forgive the Jews for Auschwitz. This, there's a fancy sociological term for it, secondary anti-Semitism. Um, I, I think Adorno in the early 60s had mentioned this phrase during a speech, but it, it's really from the late 1940s, and you know, there was a fancy German term for it, guilt, defensiveness, anti-Semitism. And the idea is that the response to the Shoah is disturbing one sense of identity, personal identity and national identity in Germany. That is the reminder of Auschwitz, whether it's a Jew living in Germany or the state of Israel, conjures up certain feelings and it disturbs one sense of wholeness. And that creates resentments and anger and it manifests itself as, as, as anti-Semitism. Um, it's been largely transferred, I would argue, to the state of Israel. That this 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 view, the secondary anti-Semitism, is playing out in terms of Israel. That Israel has now become the Jew of 1933, and its collective, this collective state, is now the target for this this notion, this sense of, of secondary anti-Semitism, and and, it's, and how it's playing out. That's why I think when you when I was in Germany during Operation Castellet, and also in Austria and Switzerland, you saw just um, a ubiquitous display of, of comparing Israel with Nazi Germany. And according to the, work, the European Union working definition of anti-Semitism, that's a, that's, a, that's a manifestation of anti-Semitism. And that's increasing. Um, this is nothing new. Um, I mean, I, there are quotes from folks who have been delving into this topic over, for over 30 years, like Jean Amri. Um, many of you probably have also heard this state, this line from anti-Zionism contains anti-Semitism like a cloud contains a storm. One other writer who I'm very fond of, Hans Meyer, who I studied when I was in England, um, said 
he's a, a, left, a leftist, by the way, considered himself a Marxist until his death, um, um, a German Jew, gay as well, and um, wrote a wonderful biography where he was dealing with all these issues at a very, in 1975, um, before anyone was willing to stand up and talk about these issues, said, I'm quoting him, whoever attacks Zionism, but by no means wishes to say anything against the Jews, is fooling himself and others. The state of Israel is a Jewish state. Whoever wants to destroy it openly or through policies that can affect nothing else but such destruction is practicing the Jew hatred of yesterday in time immemorial. So Meyer and Amri, also Henrik Broder, who um, in the mid-80s, um, before he left for Israel, said, you're still your parents' children, your Jew today is the state of Israel. These types of statements again, are capturing that notion of of, of secondary anti-Semitism. One other quote which Broder um, always mentions, and I, I think it's, it's fabulous, from um, Fassbinder, the filmmaker, um, who wrote in his play, Garbage, the City and Death, it's written in 76, I'm quoting him, and it's the Jew's fault because he makes us feel guilty because he exists. If he had stayed where he came from, or if they had gassed him, I would sleep better. So again, Fassbinder, you know, this is a very insightful, um, analysis of what's playing out in post-Holocaust Germany and why Israel or Jews who are living in that country remind many Germany, many Germans of Auschwitz and Sachsenhausen and Buchenwald and, 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 and how that's playing out. If you look at this, this, the, the statistics, I, um, I, 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 don't, I don't have any other explanatory explanation for why, according to the BBC um, polls, 77% of, of Germans have a negative view of Israel. It's the highest percentage of in, in, Europe, in Europe. The last BBC poll, the Germans tied with, this, with Spain as having the, 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 the highest percentage of negative feelings toward the state of Israel. The European Union study in 2003, uh, most Germans believe that um, um, Israel is a greater threat to um, world security. So, you know, there's all, there's all, there's, a, there's no, there's a running list, running stopping list of surveys. Um, we're closing up here, and I'll just add on this note that um, advocacy. How do you combat this, this level of anti That's the, you know, the, the question. Um, if folks have any ideas, so I, I would love to uh, to hear your suggestions or recommendations because um, this is what what's whirling around in my head all the time. How do you fight it? Um, in, uh, you know, there's there's um, institutes in, in Berlin. Well, let, let me just back up. I'm of that view where if if folks in, in Germany, for example, have more contact with Jews, and I may be incurably naive, I think that you can help to dissolve some of these resentments or more con more contact with Israelis. There's a very small community in Germany, 105,000 are members of the Central Council of Jews in Germany. So there's very little interaction. Um, I think you have to hammer away at that, that contemporary anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism. That the notion that um, is questioning Israel's right to exist or making comparisons between Israel and Nazi Germany or engaging in, a, in an intense level or disproportionate level of criticism of Israel when it contrasts from other states. I think you start zooming in on those topics you can start at least the topics on the radar screen. Um, let's, I'd, I'd rather deal with crossfire and questions because I talk too long. Yes? No, just, um, I, I suspect many people in the room are <coughs> thinking about the question that you posed at the end. Um, I think it's really important to look at what goes on at universities. There was just a report by a Palestinian journalist who did a <coughs> tour of several American universities and was shocked by the violence of the pro-Hamas and anti-Israel rhetoric that, that he was subjected to. Not from Muslim students or professors, who in, according to him were more rational and, and more able to see the sides of the question, but from Americans who were essentially, according to this article, somewhere on the left, I don't know just where. And I, I think that's really very important because that's most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about stuff. You know, they're busy working. They're not following exactly what's going on with, with German-Iranian business connections or Holocaust denial statements that are not reported at a conference. They don't know enough. But the people at universities are very important in forming 
what's going on. There are some efforts here in the states to combat this, but it's it's very widespread here. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, can, can I may ask what do you do? Um, I'm a retired Foreign Service officer, and I now have my own firm. I do writing and consulting. So I have a blog, and I, I recently posted the link to this Palestinian report. <coughs> Most of my stuff is on foreign policy, but it, it, it's a wash. What goes on here affects what goes on elsewhere, intellectually. Yeah, I mean, the, so, I mean, the universities, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm following that in a very surface level way, what's happening in the United States and, and Canada, and more in Great Britain with these academic um, right? boycotts of Israel, right. and Germany that, um, that hasn't, it hasn't reached that level where there's an academic boycott for certain reasons. There have been other sort of low, low intensity boycott initiatives from a German attack group many years ago. Mm -hmm. Some German trade unions have, have, have mentioned it's a, a, new, a member of the left party in Germany. But, but to come back, let's say, to the Muslim Brotherhood, they picked the Muslim Student Association as their first overt organization targeted specifically at students and universities. They've been very successful. They have a lot of branches. No. So, you know, this is not all by accident, as the Soviets used to say. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I just thought I'd add on this and go to your question. Just one point that mm -hmm. I didn't mention is when I was talking that most of these demonstrations that I experienced in Germany, these mass demonstrations, but other demonstrations across Germany, were largely organized by German Turks. German Palestinians and German Arabs. Um, you know, there were many folk, many Germans present at the demonstration, many from the left party, which is a very important party, uh, scoring a whole series of regional victories. Um, so you're dealing with a different organizational level with Germany, in Germany. But I've also been told that within the trade unions in Germany, that many, because of, um, you know, because of large Muslim populations, that attitudes are changing. And I didn't mention this in my talk probably because yesterday, um, there was already a talk on Islamic anti-Semitism, but this, this toxic cocktail right now of secondary anti-Semitism and Islamic anti-Semitism in Germany is what's um, you know jeopardizing um, not only the security of Israel, I would argue, but the West. Yeah. So uh, just uh, just to know, um, then, and then Professor Katz, and if anybody wants to ask a question, motion to me, and I'll put you on the list. And uh, we have about three minutes, so mm -hmm. I'll stay afterwards. If there are yeah, other questions. Okay, uh, I should, I will refer again to your last question. My impression from all the things that I've heard through, within some period of time, is that the inspiration for the secondary anti-Semitism or the new anti-Semitism comes from uh, a clearly uh, recognized source, which is the Islamic anti-Semitism. I think that, as far as I was impressed, that's really the one that inflamed the new anti-Semitism that we see. Uh, they, but it seems to me that the most effective way to combat it is to center, to make them the issue. <laughs> Till now, we notice that in the media that anything that happens in Israel, an extreme ultra nationalist government or whatever they call it, they can get to all the list of, of titles, <laughs> uh, is becoming an, a central topic of, of the news. We don't hear about extremism uh, in the Arab world. It's not de dealt with. And uh, all the issues of um, minority discrimination in the Arab world and the uh, lack of freedom of speech and uh, denial of other uh, rights, human rights, are really superficially touched upon. Those things should be the issue. I mean, we have to to decredit de 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 the accusers. And you don't do that. Yeah. I mean, one example, and I reported on this in, in in January, it was February, there is, there's a Berlin Center for Anti-Semitism Research. And um, with this just um, spectacular outbreak of vile, <coughs> hardcore anti-Semitism, there was no response from this center in terms of dealing with Islamic anti-Semitism. There's a lot of controversy surrounding the center right now, but it seems to me and other journalists in the field um, and folks who are, who are 
dealing with this issue that folks should stand up and, and highlight what's I just want to, to add one thing why I think it is happening that way. Because I think that for quite a long time, I would say over a century, uh, the, where the reaction was apologetic. Uh, the attempt was to show how good the Jewish people are. And that, I think, should be, should, that's passé. We have to show how bad the other guys are. We don't have to prove anymore. I mean, Israel was trying to, sh to show how good and civilized the Israeli military was, how careful they were, they were, they were in order to protect or not hurt civilians. Again, that, that was the same line of thinking. They had, uh, rather than showing how cruel the, the Hamas were, by operating within the civilization, and that had to be repeated in color, in details. It wasn't that. Annette, Yeah, thanks. I'm, I was wondering, at some point you said that it's perplexing, the situation in Germany, perplexing as in, um, the, what I think you uh, called it a contradiction, the internal politics and the foreign politics. And then in a sense, at the end, when you quoted Amory, et cetera, and everyone, and, um, talked about secondary anti-Semitism, you kind of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, this have, you, you disproved that yourself, that there is actually no contradiction. And I was thinking, whilst you were talking about this apparent perplexing situation, that it's precisely not perplexing. It's just, um, I think, about a code, a coding of a publicized discourse, uh, what you were talking about <coughs> in inner politics, that just doesn't show the underlying so-called private or from you know, mass level discourse. And if you look at that more closely, um, then it will overlap with the, the foreign policy much, much closer. So You're there right. is actually no contradiction. I mean, it's well, not perplexing. It is, I mean, it is a contradiction in terms of Israel's, Germany's special relationship with Israel has always been a government-based project. It's never been a civilian-based project. Similar to Germany, Israel's agreements with Jordan and Egypt. Those are agreements negotiated with governments, not with populations. And I would argue that it's a, the German-Israeli relationship is, a, is a, an agreement negotiated between governments. And the contradiction is, and this is what needs to be explored, um, you have that type of pro-Israel rhetoric on one side of the fence. Um, I mean, you know, they're not, they're not openly saying where we, we want Israel to be abolished. I mean, there are some politicians, but you know, mainstream governmental opinions of want Israel to exist. But yet we have this trade relationship. And one journalist I know I've attended the event, Henry Broder, a very famous journalist writes for Spiegel, sort of argue that um, this indifference, this widespread indifference right now to the Iranian threat might actually mean that wittingly and unwittingly um, German politicians and many Germans want Israel to be exterminated. Because if there was you know, that, that this is playing into this notion of secondary anti-Semitism, that this, this government of this country is, is a public nuisance, and we just want it to disappear. And that's why they're not taking any action against Israel. But I still think, and we can talk about this afterwards, I do think there are internal contradictions. And I don't, um, I, I'm not sure I would go that far. Mm -hmm. Professor Katz, uh, Yeah, the uh, relations between uh, Germany and Iran, I think, are best understood if you know a little bit about the history of how Germany had access to Iran. I was a dean in Iran between 1975 and 79, helping to develop a new medical center. I learned a lot about the German relationship to Iran. Let me give you some examples. Under the Qajar dynasty, before 1925, the first and oldest and best medical school in Iran was German design. Why? because Germany was the heart of science and medicine long before the U.S. became the, the top uh, in that field. In addition, uh, Reza Shah, you probably know, was a pro-Nazi who was in exile out of the country, but business was very active between <coughs> Germany and, and, and uh, Iran for many, many years. i give an example. The top pharmaceutical manufacturing company, and I knew the owners, were based in Munich and Hamburg. They set up their factories in Munich and Hamburg, and they exported back to the country some of the major pharmaceutical products. So there was a long history of relations on the business area, the science area, and the medical area. 
And I suspect even though many of my generation of the Iranians are probably either dead or dying, there must be some historical basis. I don't know what it is, but they, they are the major partner, and they were the major business partner for many years. Uh, it's, there is a long-standing relationship. I believe Siemens has been active uh, in Iran for yes. over uh, 140 years. But if Siemens, I've reported on this, is supplying the Iranians with surveillance technology, I broke this story, and um, then I wrote about it later for the Wall Street Journal, where, because of the telecommunications contracts, where the Iranian regime is not using this technology to persecute dissidents, gays, lesbians, women, um, trade unionists, and other um, political dissidents, why isn't there, I, I'm questioning, why isn't there any outrage? Not only is it being used against internal dissidents, but this technology, Siemens-based technology, is being used to track plane movements, for example, in Israel, right. transportation movements. Seems to me Siemens, which used um, exploited labor during the Holocaust, Auschwitz, it's, it's been reported on, not as extensively as it should have, um, has, in my view, some, using uh, Miracle's terminology, moral responsibility to um, terminate these types of deals. I mean, 480 billion euros each year, that's the amount of trade between Siemens and um, the Islamic Republic at a time when Iran is working in an astonishingly fast pace to build its nuclear weapons program. Um, and the question is, should they have some responsibility toward the Jewish state, right? That's what the special relationship's about. And what I'm saying is actually quite banal. I mean, it's, it's, it's indescribably banal, but it's, it just doesn't penetrate the sort of consciousness. And I, you can argue, well, it's, it's raw economic interests um, that are playing a role um, but I, 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 don't, I don't buy that as being the overriding um, factor in, in, in this whole relationship, sorry. Yeah, that, before Clemens asks this question, I'd like to just add, when you talk about this inability to, to sort of penetrate the mind, you know, I was just in Berlin, we had a ESA organized a conference last week in Berlin on uh, Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, and uh, Holocaust and all. Um, and we met with people in the Chamber of Commerce and different political parties, and we would have these discussions, uh, some colleagues and I, to these officials about very, very simple facts, and it just don't, uh, it's like a light, the, the light switch doesn't work, they just don't want to hear it. It's just, it's unbelievable. It's a denial of my mind. Yeah, colleagues, I'm writing for a large European um, newspaper, um, um, a very prestigious paper, I don't want to name it, but said that it's just a conspiracy of silence right now in Germany on this issue on all levels, in terms of just avoiding the Iranian threat and what that means for the West and Israel. Uh, first to the Iranian embassy, actually, it's interesting that the Iranian embassy in Germany, they have a homepage and it's also a kind of German uh, sector in this homepage and it's very really fascinating because they are just saying in uh, kind of uh, funny German, but anyway they say, well, we are so sad that we couldn't support Nazi Germany at, at that time because we had the pressure from other um, countries like Russia and Soviet Union. So it's interesting. So until today, the Iranian embassy is saying loudly in German language that they are sad, that they couldn't support. They think it's, it's good to say it in 2009 to the German population that we are so sad we couldn't support you some 60 or 65 years ago. So uh, that's just for the record what the Iranians think, what the Germans think they are pleased if someone is saying, well, we couldn't support you at that time, but you're so sorry. Uh, second point, I would like to ask you, what is the relationship of this uh, building institution dealing with anti-Semitism, which is actually dealing with Islamophobia or racism? And uh, I think there is a kind of, and even in the US, there's now a discussion about uh, how to treat um, um, a phenomenon which is obviously Islamic jihad, Islamic anti-Semitism. Now we have um, terror acts all over uh, the Middle East uh, the last uh, year since the Second Intifada, even before, but let's say since the Second Intifada and then we have 9-11, um, we have the war in Iraq. Now, as we know, Obama is engaged, as he is saying, and we don't use the word war on terror anymore. So, um, what do you see from uh, both um, public opinion point of view and also scholarly point of view is the relationship of academic institutions like this building center for research and anti-Semitism, which is focusing on Islamophobia and poor Muslims on the one side, and on the other side, that even politicians in the United States are just rejecting to to name a phenomenon, which it is. I mean, they just don't say it's Islamic anti-Semitism, they just say it's a um, man-made, um, Damage or what's the kind of if, if it's a, yeah man man caused 
man cause disaster. Man cause disaster. So if a Hamas guy is blowing up himself in Haifa or whatever, it's not a terrorist act. It's not Islamic anti-Semitism. It's not whatever. It's it's a man cause. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I mean, and, 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 and finally, this silence. It is silence in Germany. It's true, but it's not just silence. It's even worse. Professor Bergmann, who is uh, one of the two professors besides Professor Benz at the Institute in Berlin, he was making an interview. And, um, What's maybe, your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's making yeah, he's making an interview in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung in February, some weeks after those really dangerous demonstrations you mentioned in Berlin, and I've seen them in, in video on YouTube. <coughs> and he was saying, it's not the same if a left-wing German or right-wing German is making anti-Jewish statements and if a Muslim does the same thing. And actually most of those 10,000 people have been Muslims, yeah, to be, to be clear. And he's saying publicly in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, it's not the same if a Muslim is saying something like this because they are just scared about their relatives in Gaza, or if a German left-wing does say it, and actually does Muslims are also Germans. Well, so, um, I, mean, that, I mean, that institute is, you know, the the Berlin Center for Anti-Semitism. It's been in the press. Um, that's why it's being discussed, in, not only in the, in the Israeli press, but also in the Wall Street Journal and in the German press. The Berlin Center for Anti-Semitism Research um, is, in my view, um, it reflects, I think it's a window into the core of, of German society in that it's largely stuck in, in, during, in the period between 1933 and 1945 and is excluded largely focusing on right-wing classical anti-Semitism, that you know, sort of the, the, the biological anti-Semitism, and um, is um, not not addressing the Iranian threat. Although, and this is encouraging, um, I know that the director just wrote an opinion piece on the Tagesspiegel, Wolfgang Benz, um, because I had reported in February that the center um, did not take a position on Durban II. Um, so folks are criticizing the center for saying you know, they should, the center should, should, who's advising the German Foreign Ministry about participation, should state we're not going to, we're not going to participate in this this anti-Semitic spectacle. I reported on this because there was criticism from the head of the Auschwitz Committee in Israel, um, and a number of folks, and uh, Wolfgang Benz, I think four weeks later, then issued a, wrote a, a, an opinion, he's saying we're against it. Um, whereas in the article, when I quoted the center, they told me we don't have a position, and we're advising the government, and we're not sure. And um, so, it, it, as Charles pointed out with the, with the, the Levy quote, I think if you shine light on what's happening, and there's a lot of unsavory um, things unfolding, and not only in Germany, but across Europe, um, you can influence a change in attitudes and behavior. And that's why I'm not, I'm not excessively pessimistic. But um, combating anti-Semitism in Europe, in, in general, in Germany in particular, means you have to be willing to engage in a rather bloody, uncomfortable fight, um, where you have to hit first and hit hard and let personal feelings get in the way. Um, and if you're willing to shake up the power structure and stir things up, um, you can make progress. But it takes that type of, um, again, it creates enormous levels of discomfort, that type of clash. Diplomacy wants you to cross that track, but um, in order to combat anti-Semitism in Europe, I think you have to be um, um, very loud. Final, okay, so we'll collect two quick questions. We have like a couple of minutes, oh, very sorry. quickly. Uh, well, it was, it was not a question, just an observation. You alluded to the fact that uh, uh, Der Spiegel and only one other newspaper publicize an event uh, an anti-Semitic event that took place. And I guess it should come as no surprise to anybody that Islamist anti-Semitism doesn't sell newspapers. It's almost an accepted fact of life. Whereas uh, an act on Israel's part does sell newspapers and Israel seems to be held to a different standard than the Islamic world is held. Um, in, during the Operation Cast Lead, notwithstanding the fact that Israel went to great lengths uh, to uh, protect lives and so on and so forth, the plight of the poor Gazans was what was selling newspapers and ads, and, and that's unfortunately what happens in the media. Um, and and a, a speaker last week at the JCC said, if it bleeds, it reads. And that's an unfortunate fact of, of the way the media conduct their business. Okay. And 
Okay, uh, just to plead innocence and so on, to combat that one particular piece of German anti-Semitism, which is governmental and business dealings with Iran, rather than uh, make that bloody hue and cry uh, that that has to stop, would it, would it make more sense to say, now, congratulations, you now have leverage. The government, Siemens, whatever, you have leverage, you're in there, there are business deals. You have leverage now to influence Iran and put it upon them, the responsibility to understand what that means. Is that too subtle or too naive? Well, the, the <laughs> sure, <man. laughs> Israeli, the Israeli intelligence agencies are, and I, I, I tend to think the Israeli intelligence is, is um, more sophisticated than the Americans and the Europeans in terms of the Iranian nuclear weapons program. Um, the, the Israelis are asserting right now that within 12 months, maybe less than 12 months, we'll have the Iranians will have the capability to be build either um, warhead or weapon. Um, I think time is not our ally, and the Germans, um, uh, I, I just don't, I don't, those firms, I, I've talked to those firms, I've asked them questions, I've called them up, I've asked them about their responsibility toward the Jewish state in light of German history, and um, it's just not an issue, though. Siemens told me we don't have a responsibility to any state, um, a large oil company in, in Austria, OMB, which is desperately itching to implement its 22 billion euro uh, oil deal to develop fields in, in southern Iran, um, is also indifferent. That does not play any role. Um, you're dealing with um, you know hard charging business people who who aren't concerned about these issues, and some of whom. I mean, the question is, as you point out, I I view, I view these deals as as a form of anti-Semitism. Um, one can argue about whether the intention is there, but the effect is certainly anti-Semitic. Um, I, I, I think that's um, without, I don't want to offend you, but I think that's right, right now incurably naive to think that they'll, they'll be able to um, use their pressure within Iran to, 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 force, to modify the regime's behavior. That's a regime that's, um, you know, they're playing hardball. And look at look at the series of negotiations when you examine the last five six years between the European Union and the, and the Iranian regime. They're out organizing and out negotiating not only Europeans but right now I would argue the United States. I'm of the view of this this I know this is very this is not fashionable this is highly unpopular, but there has to be some way to um, I'm not overthrow this regime. I'm not arguing that the Americans deploy um, troops and and invade Iran. Um, but there, there, there has to be some way to bring about a, a secularized um, Western state because this regime is, 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 is dangerous and um, incorrigibly reactionary. So I don't have a problem saying that um, I advocate that type of um, transformation or, or a, a government. Um, but I'm not sure if I answered your question. We can talk about it afterwards. You know, I, I, so, I, I don't want to... Yeah. So, you just have a small response to that? No, actually, we Sorry. have to end because we're over 15 minutes. We have to be out of the room. But, but Benny's staying around all afternoon, so if you want to continue yeah. the conversation, you're welcome. At 6 o'clock, there's a reception in, uh, in um, LC 101 in the foyer there. Uh, Yossi Klein Halevi will be there, and then at 7 o'clock, he's speaking, which everybody is very welcome to come. So, we'll I'd like to hear your response. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and you're, very, you're welcome to. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay, here's his mark. The German wants to ask that kind of thing. Lord, that's it. Let's see. 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 Let's see.